Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip, for a fantastic start to the day, um, opening, I think, several doors yourself there um, onto the debate and uh, introducing a number of terms I'm sure we're going to be returning to during the course of the day, the global, the popular, um, the modern, and this question of the public and the private. We're going to move straight on now, though, to uh, uh, our next speaker, who is uh, Neil Mulholland, who's an art historian and critic uh, holding posts at the University of Edinburgh and Edinburgh College of Art. So I'm going to hand straight over to Neil. Okay. Hey, folks. Um, so what I wanted to do is just try and answer the question. I thought that was the idea today. So um, I thought really it, it's useful to break the question up into a number of different components. It's quite an awkward question. It's one of those questions that kids ask. It's kind of stupid, but quite revealing at the same time. And I thought it seems, on the face of it, quite neutral. Um, and so what I thought I'd do is start with the bits that are perhaps the the most neutral. So we need to sort of say, firstly, what is Britain? And um, I suppose, in a way, um, can I get the next slide? This is not working. This slide changer. Uh, I suppose, we, thanks. What we need to say really is uh, that Britain is the island that we're currently on. So it's, it's a way of identifying this particular island. It's not the same thing as the British Isles. That would include the Isle of Man, Skye, the Isle of Wight, and so on. And it doesn't include Ireland. Um, and if we're talking about Britain as an island then, we can only really talk about maybe going back to 8000 BC when um, around that point Britain was connected to the rest of Europe. So we've got a kind of geography or a geographical territory that we can identify and I think a, a period when we can start to talk about at least there being a, a geographical uh, territory to examine. Um, this, however, predates the period that we can meaningfully talk about something called art. So if we want to talk about uh, a British identity and art at the same time, really we need to leap a lot more into our, our own modern times. Um, we can't really talk about ancient Britons in, in relation to art, I think. Or it's, it's complicated, I think. Ancient Britons are a an idea invented by Romans, Angles, Saxons over very different time periods in different places. And, you know, arguably you have uh, constructions like the Welsh or the Scotty, they're very different. So we have to really jump, I think, to 1707 and the act of union between Scotland and England. Uh, can we go forward again? I don't know what's happened to this thing. Thanks. So, we, yeah, thanks. So we need to. We need to really sort of start with the United Kingdom of Scotland and England, and I think that there's also maybe a limit to this this kind of Britain, uh, as it were. Ah, thanks. And uh, it really lasts up until around 1999, when Scotland returns its own parliament. Um, so we've got roughly 300 years to look at in terms of what might be a British art. Um, so we then need to ask a question, well, what would this British art look like? What does it have in common, if anything? Um, there are a couple of ways that we can think about that. So we could think, firstly, that it might be concerned either implicitly or explicitly with a British imaginary. So from 1707 onwards, you start to have constructions of Britishness in visual culture. And that might, on the one hand, happen in a celebratory way, say like Alan Ramsey's painting of George III, or it could be like what Philip was talking about, this kind of neoliberal promotion of Britishness in an international market. Or it could be something which is critical, say like William Blake's attack on the slave trade, which is a, a British slave trade and upon which much of the British Empire was built. This immediately presents us with these very conflicting theories of Britishness. You know, on the one hand, you have Britain as this, this kind of evil empire. On the other hand, Britain is something which is liberal and, and about to embark on some democratic process. The question then is, which tradition, which Britain do we believe in? What is the British here? So we could say that uh, uh, another way of thinking about British art is that it might actually spring from these kind of British constructions of an imaginary. Um, there is a lot of British art, I think, that does that, which you could say is some kind of unwitting unionist propaganda. It's generally reactionary. It tends to focus on Britain as some form of monoculture or product that can be distributed and sold, consumed. It might be royalist, as in the case of Alan Ramsey. 
and it tends really uh, to promote a status quo of vested interests, much like the way in which a small coterie of investors created the UK in the first place. So the UK is a kind of uh, business deal. That's why it exists. That's why it was set up in 1707. So we could, I suppose, have a bit of both of these things. You could have a, a construction of the imaginary, some self, very self-conscious process of myth-making happening in the name of Britishness. But at the same time, you could have people making British art in an almost uh, unconscious way, not, not really kind of aware of the contingencies of the time and the place that they work in. So if we're going to talk about British art in this sense, we need to do it in terms which are geopolitical, so that pay attention to the geography of the politics of the situation, or maybe which have some anthropological terms. And we need to talk about how the conditions under which Britishness is created uh, change and how they're contested. Um, now, I think it's simple enough to have this kind of analysis if we bracket the terms well enough. So we might work from a, an art historical or museological position. Um, you know, we might look at collections of things or visual culture that's produced on, on Britain or in Britain. Um, this, however, I think is difficult when it comes to talking about contemporary art practice, which is, I suppose, what I'm interested in. Um, the difficulty there is that to talk about British art in these terms implies that it's the artist's job to somehow represent British culture, as if they were some sort of anthropologist parachuted in from somewhere else, maybe like Tintin on a British adventure. Now, I think this is a very 90s idea of art practice, the idea of the anthropological turn, that culture is this thing that's pre-formed that you just respond to or which you use to sort of bounce off your own representations. It's the same problem that occurs with something like, say, the Turner Prize and its representation of Britishness, or something like the British Pavilion, say, in, in Venice. Um, and I think um, they imply some sort of representational role that can't be fulfilled by contemporary art, ultimately, e either in the implicit or explicit sense. We can't insist on art that is made in Britain being British in the, the way in which the, the Venice Pavilion seems to imply. Of course, we need to remember that the analysis of Britishness is in part uh, part of the production of Britishness. So it's a kind of double bind. Tate Britain is in this kind of bind. It produces British art just by the fact that it draws a line in the sand around this so-called British art. And it does this erroneously in many ways. For example, there was no 16th century British art, and yet the Tate supposedly looks at art from 1500 onwards. Um, so Tate Britain is, is an act of territorialization in this sense. It's a, a means by which we might reflect upon a colonial act, but it is in its own right a colonial institution or colonizing institution. So Britishness is isn't really there to see in terms of art unless we create this frame and make it explicit in the way in which Tate Britain does that. So the next part of the question I wanted to look at is this idea of great British artists. So um, I suppose it's really sort of focusing on the, uh, sorry, uh, on the, and the, uh, sorry, I want to focus on the British part of it, sorry. Um, and I think this may be a different question then from this idea of you know what is Britain and, and how can we kind of place art um, in a, a British context um, within institutions like um, Venice or the Tate um, to do to talk about British artists and in, in, in terms of individuals we need to to do two things I think firstly we need to define what we mean by British in a cultural context so we need to say are we talking about people who live in Wales England and Scotland which is to say on the island of Britain. Or do, do we talk about people who identify themselves as being British either because they have UK citizenship or because they identify themselves as being ethnically British in some way or other? Um, now, there are many people basically who, who live and work in Britain who don't have UK citizenship, who may consider themselves to be British or not. And there are plenty of people who live in Britain who do have UK citizenship who don't think they're British. So I don't think that I'm British in that sense. So we have to rule out that option, I think, of saying that you are British just because you live in Wales, England, or Scotland. We could then say, do we mean people who think that they are ethnically British, who may or may not live in Britain? Um, this then is problematic, I think, because it raises the, the question of, well, who decides this? 
So who is it up to? Is it up to the Tate Britain? Is it up to the, you know, the Turner Prize, uh, Venice, and so on? Um, it's a tricky situation, I think, especially because it again implies some sort of act of territorialization, and it's one that is never going to be wholly consensual. So the, the most you can do is make some sort of self-identification of ethnicity. You can't have it made for you. Um, a good example might be Liam Gillick's participation in Venice on behalf of Germany and the German pavilion. This immediately kind of gives a sense of the artist as some sort of mercenary who has a certain sort of uh, mobility which is maybe denied to most ordinary citizens of nation states. And the, the kind of nationalism, in other words, that Gillick is playing around with here in terms of patronage is more medieval than it is Victorian. Um, we could take, uh, as another example, we could take Susan Phillips, who recently won a Turner Prize for British art. Um, Susan lives in Berlin, which last time I checked was in Germany. Before that, she studied and worked in Belfast, which is in Ireland rather than in Britain. And before that, she studied in Duncan of Jordanston in Dundee. Um, a long time before that, she grew up in Glasgow. Her father is Burmese, and she's moved around a lot. She's trained in very different contexts. None of those contexts, I would say, are um, explicitly British in, a, in, the, in the sense in which she, the Turner Prize might claim her as a British artist. And, or at least I wonder what help, or what, what, um, what help it, it gives us to, in terms of how we understand her art or the development of her art to talk about her in these terms. The patronage, in a sense, that has led her to make the work that she does doesn't really... Um, that isn't really explained by um, focusing on the Britishness. Similarly, she's claimed for Glasgow because she's a Glaswegian, but her art isn't really in any way part of a, a, a Glasgow art scene, or she, she's not a Glasgow artist. She's a, a, a Northern Irish stroke Berlin-based artist, I would say. So again, she's a kind of a mercenary type artist, as, as many artists are, of course. Um, so. The whole idea of a kind of ethnicised patronage, which British art implies, doesn't really ever get to these thorny questions of what is nationhood or what constitutes a collective or ethnic identity. And it absolutely must do this, otherwise it is just entirely meaningless um, and is effectively just an act of colonialism. Um, so we need to, when we talk about Britishness, we really need to uh, say much more than this is British in, in terms of pointing at something. We would need to actually think about why those identifications are being made, what, what kind of purpose they might serve for that particular artist or for the people who have some kind of vested interest in their career. Um, this is the start, I think, of very, a, a, a number of conflicting value judgments regarding the value of ethnicity itself, and it's an impossible uh, question, I think, in a lot of ways, it's not something we can answer in a, a very straightforward sense. So, the last part, really, I suppose, I wanted to get to of the question is the great part of it. So, you know, what, why are there no great British artists? It sort of implies that there's a sliding scale of greatness, uh, some sort of uh, um, benchmark that we need to think of in terms of these British artists and, and their um, mastery. And I suppose the the problems with this against are, are, are legion, really. Um, so some artists um, maybe are lauded in ways which would suggest that they're a formative influence on our time. Um, but to imagine that that makes them great, I think, is folly, because what, what we think now about artists, say, like Turner, might change in the future. It's certainly not been what we've always thought about Turner, what we think about Turner now. So you know, we, we kind of change our value judgments, and we make value judgments in relation to what we want now, so we are thinking about what we kind of want from the past. Um, so we can't have any sort of fixed exemplars of value. We need to say, how can we be certain that we've chosen the correct exemplars? How do we know we've got the right canon? And if it is a question of establishing a canon, then we have to say, well, on what grounds? And of course, not only does this raise all these questions of ethnicity, belonging and not belonging, it, it raises the very question of, well, why would we be convinced by one person rather than another over their inclusions and exclusions? So in order, I think, even to do this, to try to even set out to talk about British art or British artists or, or greatness in British art, we're immediately involved in some sort of ethnic essentialism. 
Uh, in other words, we need to kind of somehow evaluate the Britishness of art in, in, in relation to this shadowy uh, British quality, um, as though there were somehow degrees of Britishness, as if Britishness were an essentialist kind of quality that we can benchmark things in relation to. So this, this is another kind of old territorialization act. I think it's Leavis site, you know, it goes back to Matthew Arnold maybe. It implies that there are ethnic constructions of Britishness that we can find in art. Uh, rather that, uh, that are kind of fixed, I suppose, rather than that they are being, uh, these ethnic constructions are made and that they can be unmade. So the problem with this, I think, really ultimately is that we can make anything seem as if it is uniquely and essentially British, like the sausage, for example. They don't have sausages in France or Germany or Spain, apparently. So the sausage is, you know, is, is a British thing, the British banger. So Britishness, I think, is... It isn't a benchmark, it's not a fixed entity, it's not something, therefore, that we can use to benchmark or evaluate anything, so we can't talk about greatness in relation to Britishness or Great Britishness in that way. It's, it's meaningless. The impact of the artist is irrespective, in other words, of whether or not they are ethnically or legally British. It's irrelevant. And then finally, uh, I suppose the last part of the question is, why have there been no Great British artists? Well, I mean, this implies, you know, there have been absolutely no artists of any merit who happen to have lived or worked in Britain. Um, I don't really sort of think this makes sense in a way. A lot of artists have lived and worked in Britain. Um, some might be considered to be good, some not. It depends who you ask. Um, it's not like there's a committee somewhere who decide this. It's not decided by Saatchi or, or some kind of individual who has a sort of great overview of these matters. It's something that is negotiated, that's in dispute. It doesn't settle, so we can't determine it. Uh, we, we, you know, we can't, um, we can't make these kind of value judgments ultimately about greatness and, and or, or even uh, to the exclusion of, of uh, all artists who happen to have been unfortunate enough to have lived and worked in Britain. So um, I suppose ultimately, the question, why have there been no great British artists, to me isn't really very helpful in terms of thinking about art. Culture is just ordinary, it's just what people do. The kind of frames of reference that we might use to evaluate culture are like small magnetic fields. They only operate in their immediate spheres of influence. So to use a neoliberal uh, system of judgment, which Philip was using earlier, we're, we're kind of working in a small magnetic field. If we're very heavily involved in artist-run subcultures, again, we have a, a very small magnetic field. If we ask the question, have there been any great British tennis players? Again, the field that we're operating in is small and it doesn't overlap into other areas in, a, in an easy, straightforward way. So we need to kind of think uh, about these questions differently, I think. We can't really ask this question in a, in a way that would uh, would lead to any kind of meaningful answer. So in a nutshell, I think really we should just stop talking about art in these terms and as if it was somehow to do with whether or not you're, you're, you're gonna qualify for the Welsh rugby team. It's just completely irrelevant. Okay, thanks. Yeah.